Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Elizabeth Richard, and I'm the daughter of late Barbara Gone Day, in whose memory this endowed lecture has been named. Tonight's author event, along with many other critical and enriching free library programs that advance literacy, guide learning, and inspire curiosity, is made possible only through the generous private support. Please consider making a gift and helping the free library improve the lives throughout our region. I'm very pleased to introduce Valerie Jarrett, our, the longest serving senior advisor in the Obama administration. She oversaw the offices of public engagement and intergovernmental affairs, chaired the White House Council on Women and Girls. Today, she is a senior advisor to the Obama Foundation and a distinguished senior fellow at the University of Chicago Law School. Born in Iran in and raised in the 1960s Chicago, Ms. Jarrett originally practiced corporate law, then left to enter local politics. In 1991, she interviewed an up-and-coming lawyer named Michelle Robinson, who, as you all know, went on to become First Lady of the United States, and the rest is history. One she tells in her new memoir, Finding My Voice, My Journey, West, Journey to the West Wing and the Path Forward. Her talk tonight will be in conversation with six ABCs, Tamala Edwards, weekday morning co-anchor of Action News and a regular co-host of Inside Story. We're so pleased to have them with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Valerie Jarrett and Tamala Edwards to the Free Library. Good evening and welcome to the Free Library. It is always an honor to be here, and in particular, it's an honor to be here with Valerie Jarrett. Um, I do have to have a fangirl moment because she's a Stanford graduate, as am I. So, a little bonding there, and also having read the book so much to dig into. And I'll start with a connection between you and President Obama. You start the book writing about growing up in Iran and giving the reasons why that happened. But for most of your life, when people want to talk about it, you just jump over it. Till Then you meet Barack Obama and you actually dig into it. And it made me wonder, one of the things that has often been said about him is some people have wondered, was it necessary for him to almost have grown up outside of the traditional black experience, that there was something about not having to deal with the disappointments and the skepticisms that fueled his ability to have that hope. I wondered about your opinion on that, and also what did it mean for you to have been able to have that time outside of this prescribed sense of race in America as a child to become who you are? What an interesting question. <laughs> wow, thank you, Tam, and good evening, everyone. I am delighted to be here. You are packed in here, that's so exciting. <laughs> I'm really thrilled. This is the second day of my tour, so I must be doing something right. She loves right. us. She came here. I do. <laughs> so uh, it's a it's a very interesting question, and we actually talked about it the first time we met. So just a little bit of background. So my mother grew up in Washington, in Chicago. My dad grew up in Washington D.C. during the Jim Crow era. And my father uh, was a physician, and he wanted to work at an academic institution to do research. And when he came out of the Army, he couldn't find a job where he was earning the same amount as his white counterparts. And so he and my mom, who I will say were a little crazy, decided, well, let's go outside of the United States and look and see if there are better opportunities for a black doctor, doctor outside of our country than there are right here at home. And he heard about a position that was available starting a brand new hospital in Shiraz, Iran. And so he and my mom went off to Iran. He helped start the hospital, and he chaired the Department of Pathology. I was the second baby born in the hospital. They practiced on some other poor child first. <laughs> Got that out of the way, and then along comes Valerie. And we lived there until I was five. And from there, he was recruited to go to the Galton Labs at the University College of London because of the research that he was doing in Shiraz. And from there, he gave a paper at some international conference and the dean of the medical school at the University of Chicago heard him and was impressed by him and offered him a job. And so my dad used to always say to me that sometimes the shortest distance to where you want to go is the longest way around. <laughs> and he was right. But at that first dinner when I, I met then uh, Barack Obama, not even Senator Obama, he'd just finished law school, and I was trying to hire his fiance, and I thought I had wooed her pretty well until she told me, well, my fiance doesn't think it's such a great idea that I go and work for you in the mayor's office. And I said, well, who's your fiance and why do we care what he thinks? And <laughs> I want you, not him. And she said, well, his name is Barack Obama and he started his career as a community organizer 
And he has some real reservations about me going from a law firm right into uh, the fire. At least when I joined city government, I started out as a lawyer, so that's not quite as political as the mayor's office. And she said, will you have dinner with us? And so that's what led to our first conversation. And uh, I did not like to talk about being born in Iran when I was young. When we first moved back to the United States, I was almost six. And uh, here I am, a fair skin, uh, freckle faced. I had bright, bright red hair at the time, a kid from a country no one had ever heard of. I had stopped in, I told you, London for that year. So I picked up a British accent. My parents plopped me down in a public school in our neighborhood, and I used to get beat up all the time. Oh, and I was also, I'd skipped two grades, so I was five years old in second grade. I was a misfit. I lost that British accent like the first week. I was like, no, that's not going to work in here. But I couldn't do anything about the class that I was in, and I, so I, I just was bullied, and I stopped talking about Iran. And I regret that, and I think it's natural. Children want to be just like everybody else. No one wants to stand out and be an other. And so I wanted to fit in. And my mother was really proud. She learned Farsi while we were in Iran. And so whenever she wanted to speak to me in public and say something that she didn't want anybody else to understand, she would speak in Farsi. And usually it was like, sit down, be quiet. you know. And I would be embarrassed. And people would stare. And I would say, oh, please don't speak Farsi. And then I stopped speaking Farsi. And so I really kind of shut down on that whole experience. And so when I met Barack Obama, uh, well, 20 some odd years later, maybe 30 years later, uh, the first thing he said to me is, so where are you from? So I said, Chicago. And he said, were you born here? And I went, oh dear. <laughs> so I said, no, I was born in Iran. And normally you know, I brace for myself for some kind of a reaction. And he said, well, that's interesting. He said, you know, I lived in Indonesia for a while and I was born in Hawaii. And we started talking about what our experiences were like. And I started to feel like this is finally somebody who understands this rather unusual childhood that I've had because he had a similarly unusual childhood. And uh, we agreed on three things. Number one, that we could walk into a room and find something in common with whoever was in the room. And it's, I, you know, this hospital compound where I grew up, there were British and French and Iranian and American doctors all working together, and I played with their kids. And so I spoke French and English and Farsi all in one sentence most often. <laughs> and we found a way to communicate. And I think it's because of that experience early on that I kind of expect I'll figure out how to communicate. The other thing we talked about that we had in common was that uh, an appreciation for the United States that people who have not lived in underdeveloped countries might not have. And so, I mean, nothing I ate um, was uh, free of not being boiled, all of my Liquids had to be boiled or peeled or whatever. Well, I guess the food was peeled and the liquids were boiled. Um, the diseases for which if you contracted, the consequences could be extraordinary serious that we don't have to worry about here. The civil liberties, and not that the United States is perfect, but my goodness, we have civil liberties that are recognized as a part of our democracy that are not shared the world over. And so we talked about that. And then the final thing that we recognized was that the United States um, is the greatest country already on Earth, but it's not the only country on Earth, and that we can learn a great deal outside of the United States. And so we really bonded around the fact that we'd have these, this kind of different childhood experience that shaped our worldview and how the United States fits into the broader world, and an expectation, as my parents said to me, that life would treat us fairly if we competed and we were willing to work twice as hard, and we had a great big dream, and we had a little bit of luck. And my father described it as that he, in a sense, he took me over the, over the color barrier that he and my mom did not escape because of their childhood. And they raised me aspirationally as the world mm -hmm. they hoped it would be for me. And I kind of fell for it. And the reason I say I fell for it is that after, oh, I'm going on long here. Well, this is a long answer to your short question, but I'll conclude with this. So right after the uh, first presidential election when President Obama won, he and Mrs. Obama were on 60 Minutes, and it was just priceless. And I watched it with my parents, and my dad was very ill, and he was in rehab, and it was, it was a really poignant, special moment. And when it was over, my mother looked at me, and she said, how did you know that he could win? Not that he would win, but even that he could. I said, because you raised me to believe if you worked twice as hard and you really had a dream and you went for it and you had a little bit of luck and we had a lot of luck, then anything was possible. And she said, well, I never believed that. 
<laughs> and then my father pipes in. He's like, I didn't believe that either. And so it's really when I realized that they, they raised me really aspirationally. And I think that's what we want to do for our children. We don't want to really hamstring them with um, our history. And I think it was possible because of that experience in Iran. My father's self-confidence grew there. He wasn't a black doctor who was subject to discrimination. He was an American doctor who was treasured. And I think that's very similar to the experience that Barack Obama had growing up in a household. Let's face it, the people who loved him most in the world were white. His mother, his grandparents, and he grew up in Hawaii where anything's possible, right? <laughs> Everybody looks like all kinds of things there. And he did have to do kind of a reckoning with his identity as an African American, but he wasn't kind of burdened with, with the history that, his, um, that my parents were burdened with. The memoir is, as you might imagine, very, very personal. You talk about things including your marriage and why it didn't work out. And I was struck by the fact that you kind of go through an arc of, I'm going to make this work, I'm going to make this work. This isn't working. Okay, that didn't work, I'm moving on. Yeah, that cut my losses you, pretty, pretty quickly there. You did not do something a lot of women would do, which is really beat themselves up over the failure. It was like, okay, that happened. I'm actually kind of relieved to be able to move on with my life. Why do you think you didn't fall into that? Well, to be honest with you, initially I did feel like a failure because people in my family didn't get divorced. My parents were married for 62 years, happily married for 62 years. And, and I did, I just thought I could will it. And I, I, will, I will confess to you, the whole thing didn't really make any sense. So I had this plan when I came out of college that I was going to go straight to law school because I couldn't figure out what else to do. And uh, my mother told me I needed to have an advanced degree. And so I go to law school and I said, all right, so first law school, then I'll figure out what I want to do with this law degree. Um, I will go and work really, really hard and be successful. I will fall in love. I will get married. I will have a baby by the time I'm 30, with that biological clock ticking away. And I'll live happily ever after. <laughs> Seemed like a good plan to me, right? And so I just was on that course. And uh, I married, figuratively, the boy next door in that our mothers grew up in the same apartment building. Our dads were friends, our grandmothers were friends. Uh, he was a doctor, my dad was a doctor. When I was eight and he was 12, I had the biggest crush on him. He was um, an altar boy and I used to just look at him going down the aisle and he was wicked twinkle in his eye. It should have told me right there. And, um, <laughs> and when I came home from law school, I was like, well, I've got to find a husband because that's going to make me whole. It's going to make me complete, and it's going to make sure that it's going to ensure my happiness. And I didn't really take the time to get to know him. He looked really good on paper, and I'd had this crush since I was eight. So it seemed like it should work, and it didn't. Darn it was it. a disaster. The only good, really good thing that came out of it was my daughter. And I just thought I would sit in my office in this fancy office at this big law firm, and I would just cry, and that's how I started the book, which is like I just was miserable, and I thought, this couldn't be my life. I was not meant to be this unhappy. What happened to my plan, that excellent plan of mine? I did have my daughter just shy of my 29th birthday. That worked out well. Um, she's, she's perfect. She's 33 now, so I say that with some history. Um, but I had to make a decision, like, what are you going to do here? And I did feel like... Throughout my life, whenever I had worked really, really hard, I had gotten my way. And I could not make this marriage work. And I did feel like a failure for a minute. But, but that did not stop me from getting a divorce. So I said, all right, this didn't work. I'm going to get a divorce. I must be a failure. Um, and then I was miserable at the law firm, too. And then the most amazing thing happened. Uh, you know, you always need to phone a friend. So I phoned this friend of mine. I said, what am I going to do? I'm on my second law firm. I can't go to another one. It's probably not the law firm. It's probably something about me and this private practice of law. And he said, words I'll never forget. He said, Valerie, why don't you consider a city government? Harold Washington had just won a second term as mayor of Chicago. I would volunteered on his campaign. And I mean, like, volunteered knocking on doors. I didn't have any position or anything. And he said, you believe in his progressive agenda. Why don't you try it? You'll feel a part of something really special. And I thought, but I'm on my 10-year plan. And <laughs> I'm moving ahead. And he said, so what? Swerve. Swerve. Get outside of that comfort zone. And I did. And I remember my first day, I walked into City Hall, and I got off on the fifth floor, and it said, Office of the Mayor. That was not my office. Um, and I turned, and I walked into 
the corporation counsel's office and my boss came to meet me at the door and he said, let me take you to your office. And he did air quotes. And I thought, well, why is he doing air quotes? <laughs> well, because it was a cubicle facing an alley, window. He said, you have a window facing an alley. And I kind of took a gut check and I thought, you know what, this is actually where I belong. And I never looked back. But your mother felt differently. She's like, you went from the office yeah. in the sky looking at Lake Michigan to this. And that leads to my next question, which is a lot of people will pick up this book and they want to be inspired by somebody who took the leap. And in a short, and I shouldn't say short, you build to the point where you're the CEO of a company, heading an agency, on boards, like this has worked out. Some of the people reading the book are, will be afraid that if I leave, I'll still be at that cubicle on the fifth floor. What do I do? What's your best advice to make it work out? Well, I had a mentor when I, I was in that cubicle. My client, actually, she worked in the mayor's office. And I was doing really complicated financial uh, real estate deals that I had learned how to do at the law firm. So it did have some useful purpose. It gave me a really good training in how to be a good lawyer. And she took me under her wing. Now, her name is Lucille Dobbins, and she was tough. People were, investment bankers would just wither before her. Uh, and she, was, she said to me, Valerie, our job is to look out for the taxpayers. That's not their job. That's our job. And so she really trained me, and she helped me in more ways than I could ever uh, thank her for, including crazy things like I finally worked up the nerve to say, by this time, Laura's talking, my daughter. And, I, and she's like, are you coming home for dinner? Are you coming home for dinner? And I said, Lucille, I got to start getting home by bedtime. I just cannot work 14, 15 hour days. I'm a single mom. And my parents were there and very supportive. But you know, single mom's got to show up. And Lucille said, well, how about this? You live between downtown and my home. I'll stop by your home, put Laura to bed, and then we'll work after she goes to bed. Well, what client does that for you, right? <laughs> Now, I did start fixing dinner for her, so she got something out of it. Uh, but it was so supportive. And then she said to me, after two years of working together, she said, you know what? You should go and ask for a promotion. And I said, why would I do that? And she said, because you deserve it. In fact, you should ask for a double promotion. Your boss should be reporting to you. <laughs> exactly. I laughed just like that. I said, well, that's just ridiculous. I said, when my boss's boss, his boss, determines that I am deserving. He'll give it to me. And she said, no, he won't. He's not thinking about you. She said, go ask for it. Well, I wouldn't have dreamed of doing such a thing, except for the fact that it got really awkward to see her day after day after day, where she'd say, did you go? Did you go? <laughs> so finally, I thought, let me just get this over with. I know he's going to say no. It's going to be really embarrassing. But let me just go in there and do it. But I didn't want to be unprepared. So I wrote down all the reasons why I was deserving of this ridiculous promotion. And I go in, I still can see Judd. He looked at me over his glasses, and he listened to me very carefully. And then he said, OK. <laughs> I said, what? Are you kidding me? And I, you know, I went back, and I said, Lucille, he gave me the promotion. Well, fast forward, really fast forward. I give my book to Michelle Obama's chief of staff um, a couple of months ago, maybe a month ago. And I said, I just want you to read it, make sure you're comfortable with it, and then I have my facts pretty much um, right. And after it, she said, you know, that story about the promotion didn't make sense to me. It was too easy. I said, you think? I think I deserved it. What are you talking about? It was too easy. I just went and made a compelling case. I was surprised, but I was very happy and quite deserving. And uh, she said, yeah, it doesn't ring true. So I started calling people who were in the book to tell them how they're featured. And so I called Lucille, and I said, you know what, Lucille? This is Obama's chief of staff read the book, and she thought that promotion seemed too easy. Did you say anything to Judd <laughs> before I did? And this is like 30 years ago, right? That's happened. And she chuckles, and she said, might have. <laughs> and she never told me that she did that. And to me, that's the difference between a mentor who kind of pulls you aside and tells you what you should do and an advocate. She advocated for me when I didn't even know she was doing it. And so the reason why he wasn't surprised is he knew I was coming. And the reason why she was so determined that I go in and ask for it myself is she knew I would get it. But she wanted me to go and ask for it. And so she taught me an awful lot about how to find my voice and advocate, not just for other people, but for myself. So don't just look for a mentor. Look for the person who When you're will... not in the room, you need somebody going to bat for you. There are a number of stories in the book, and one made me cry. Oh, dear. And I don't cry a lot. Earl, in the elevator. Oh, it's my favorite story. So I, I won't tell it's the story. It's a long one. I think one. you should tell it. All right. I'll try to give you the shorter version. 
so we're not here all night. So in the uh, 2008 presidential campaign primary season, we were traveling around the country and we were in Austin, Texas. And uh, then Senator Obama had just had a debate with, um, with uh, Senator Clinton the night before. And he didn't like debating her. She was really good. They didn't really disagree about that much. And so he was kind of in a funk. And he's actually not a morning person. You don't have to go back and tell him I said that. <laughs> Uh, but he's not, and I am, and I'm always cheerful in the morning. It's my favorite time of day, but my mother was not a morning person, so I learned early just, you know, tread lightly with people who are not morning people, and you know, lower your voice and don't be quite so chipper. So at 7.30 in the morning, we're getting in an elevator, and he's got a cold, and he's grumpy, and I'm like being very quiet, and uh, this gentleman who was operating our elevator, cleared his throat. And I thought, mm, I wouldn't go into a conversation with him right now. I've done that, doesn't work, doesn't work, it's too early. And he cleared his throat and he said, sir, I'd like to give you something. So I'm nosy, so I'm looking to see what it is. And it's a patch from his military uniform. And that's what I did, I went, oh my God. And uh, then Senator Obama recognizes what it is and he said, sir, I couldn't possibly accept this. And the gentleman goes, I insist. And they go back and forth and back and forth and finally, the gentleman says, sir, I've carried this patch with me every day for 40 years. I served our country. It's uh, protected me through some really challenging times. And I want you to have it. It's, it's something I can do for you. Well, I burst into tears, right? <laughs> and it was a small elevator, and it was awkward, because it wasn't like, you know, like little tears. It was like, <gasps> couldn't catch my breath tears. And, I, and this was before people started handing their newborn babies to President Obama <laughs> over a mosh pit to the back of a room. And I'd go, that's your baby. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you, is it that important that you get a picture? Look at all the opportunities for it to drop along the way. <laughs> so long before that stuff started happening, um, I was just so moved. And so later in the day, we had a quiet moment together. And I said, what did you do with that military pass? And he said, I put it in my pocket. And I thought, you know what, you typical man. I don't mean like, where did you physically put it? I meant, how did it make you feel that this man is separating from his most cherished possession and giving it to a stranger? And he said, as he's wont to do when I say stuff like that, uh, he said, Valerie, I put it in my pocket. And he proceeds to reach his hand in his pocket. And he pulls out 10 or 12 trinkets. And he puts them on the table. And he tells me the name of the person, if he knows it, who gave it to him the circumstances behind the gift and why it was so precious that he kept it in his pocket. And so when we um, went to Washington, I thought, well, what am I going to do to keep myself grounded? Because this is some pretty heady stuff. And the world was in chaos and there was a lot going on. And I thought, for some reason, this man's story just always stuck with me. And I thought, well, maybe what I'll do is every day when I come to work, I'll think about him as I'm driving through the gates of the White House, a place that I would have never in my wildest dreams thought I would have worked. And so that's what I did. I usually came in in the dark, and uh, the lights of the Washington Monument blink red. And so as I pulled up to the Secret Service gate, waiting for clearance to go through, I would look at the Washington Monument, and I would say, do something today that makes that man proud. And I tell this story all the time, because it's just, it's so symbolic of what the campaign was all about. People just dedicating themselves to the greater good, trying to help move someone forward where they had you know, no ability to influence policy or anything else. They just believed in somebody and wanted to give them a piece of themselves, an unselfish act of generosity. And so uh, a reporter from the Washington Post heard this story uh, in the first term, early on. And so as the second term was coming around, inauguration, she called me and she said, Valerie, remember that story about the guy in the elevator? I said, of course I do. I think about him every day. And so she said, I want to find him and I want to write a profile on him as you go into the second term. And my immediate reaction was, no, what if he's an ax murderer? <laughs> I've been thinking about him every day. I don't know him. He's a stranger. I have made up a fantasy of this man. Who knows what he's like? So I was very uncooperative, but she's a pretty good reporter. And so she said, well, what city were you in? I said, Austin. What hotel? I don't have any idea. So she starts just checking hotels in Austin. Don't you know she found this man? And I didn't know his name even. I mean, I, had no, I was not helpful. So I'm in, um, I'm in Hawaii with the Obamas between uh, the election and the inauguration on vacation. 
resting from the campaign, and I get an email from Karen Tumultry, and she said, I found the man, his name is Earl Smith, and he's now head of security for the Hyatt Hotel in Austin, Texas. And here's his email if you'd like to contact him. So I'm on the treadmill while I'm reading this email, as I want to do, and it's early in the morning, and the, uh, President Obama's still asleep, and I stop off the treadmill, which I recommend you do when you get emotional emails like that, <laughs> And I composed an email back to him that went something like this. Dear Mr. Smith, my name is Valerie Jarrett. I'm the woman who was in the elevator crying hysterically when uh, you gave President Obama that gift. I'm sure you don't remember me, but I wanted to let you know that I think about you every day. <laughs> it went on and on from there. And uh, shortly, he writes me back and he said, Dear Miss Jarrett, yes, I do remember you. And I want you to know that there hasn't been a single day that I am not absolutely delighted that I gave him that gift. Right? So um, when President Obama wakes up and after he's had like a little time to wake up, I said, do you remember the Earl Smith? He goes, of course I do. I got the military patch. And he said, I said, well, I found him. And uh, his name is Earl Smith and he's head of security. And he said, that's amazing. And he knew I had been thinking about him every day. And he said, you should invite him to the inauguration as my guest. And so Mr. Smith came to Washington. <laughs> and oh my goodness. So he went to the inauguration. And then the next day, day after the inauguration, President Obama said, well, have him come by the Oval Office. And so I was joking with him out front. He was as delightful as I could have ever imagined him in my fantasy to be. And when he walked into the Oval Office, he stood up straight and he saluted President Obama. And of course, I burst into tears. <laughs> And then the final thing we did is that for the final State of the Union, when President Obama populated the First Lady's box with just all these amazing people who were ordinary people who did amazing things and touched him deeply, in the course of his campaigns and presidency, he invited Earl Smith to sit in the First Lady's box. And so he's still my friend. I still email with him from time to time. So you see why I cried when I read that section of the book? <laughs> You give a couple of examples in the book. We're in a moment now where we talk about divides and wonder how to cross them. But you come at it in an interesting way talking about what can even happen among allies. And I think people have this week heard you talk about the story of having to ad advocate for the women who began to feel as though they were not being heard in the White House. But you also tell a story, or you tell the story of Barack Obama's very focused on Iowa. And black people began to say, we're feeling ignored. And you there are none of have, us in Iowa. <laughs> uh, exactly. And you have this meeting, and people pretty much call them to task, and it's clear that half of the room just doesn't get it. What is, how does that inform how you look at this moment right now, that when even your friends can have a tough time, what do we do in a moment like this when it seems as though there is no bridge? We're in a tough moment. And, uh, and you're right, it's interesting. I mean, part of the reason why President Obama always surrounded himself with a diverse room of people is so he would get different perspectives. And his campaign manager was determined that we win Iowa. And he said, if we don't win Iowa, he will not be a credible candidate and there'll never be a South Carolina. And so we really have to put all our eggs in one basket. And the pressure I was getting from black leaders around the country was that <coughs> it was showing disrespect for the black community for him to only be in Iowa because there aren't any black people in Iowa. And so they wanted him to go to other places. And so there was this healthy tension going on and it was hard to talk about it, even among friends. And President Obama, who loves nothing better than to call a question and say, OK, there's a disagreement. Let's all come in the room and have a conversation. It was a tense conversation. And he said, I shouldn't have to choose. I can, it shouldn't be either or. I can do both and. Uh, but I'm going to spend a lot of time in Iowa, but I'm going to make phone calls to people who are leaders in the black community. And so we figured out a way to work through it together. And he did win Iowa. And I don't think he would have won the presidency. Well, maybe he would have. But I'm not sure he would have won if he hadn't won Iowa. Uh, and so the question is, what do you do at a time in our country where there is so much kind of toxicity in the air and you know, the, the um, revolution of social media has taken off considerably since President Obama ran his first or even his second campaign. And I worry, and I was just um, at Penn, and I said this to the students quite gingerly, but I worry that they are so used to creating their own community in this device in the palm of their hand. 
and that it is um, determined by them. So when I grew up, and as I look around the room, maybe some of you, you know, whatever Walter Cronkite said was true, right? He said it once a day, we knew it was gonna be right. He wasn't blurring the lines between news and information and editorial and entertainment, he was just Walter Cronkite. And we don't have that now. We all get to decide on demand what we wanna believe, and we get to self-select, and we don't have to listen to voices with which we disagree if we don't want to, because it's all on demand. And that makes me really, really nervous. And I think there is a humanity in looking at the face of the person to whom you're talking, not hiding behind the anonymity of social media. And um, my younger cousins who are like you know, teenagers were talking about ghosting people. I'm like, what <laughs> is that? And one of them told me this story about meeting some, a friend of his, not him, met somebody in you know, one of those Tinder, whatever those sites are that people go on. People keep telling me I should go on, but I'm not. Um, and he takes this woman out on a date, and he doesn't. He really was turned off by her. She was quite, I don't know, offensive, whatever. By the time the cocktails were over, so he gets up to go to the bathroom, pays the bill, and he leaves. Didn't say goodbye. I don't care how rude she was. You say goodbye. It's not working. Let's call it an end of the evening early. And I'm worrying that our young people aren't learning how to do that. They're, they're, and so when you layer that on to a tone coming out of Washington that I don't think if I had young children I would let them watch television right now. No. I want them to have a role model that they can believe in and look up to. And, uh, who's honest and who, who is um, you know, true to the vision, I think, of, of our country and bringing out our better angels, if you will. And so what do we do about it, right? And I think it depends on you. It depends on every single individual. And part of what I say near the end of the book, and it doesn't mean you don't have to read the beginning of the book when I tell you this, <laughs> is because uh, the ending is the path forward, right? Is, is that we do have to really seize our responsibility as citizens. We have to get involved, and it, and it, can, be, it can be quite disappointing and soul-crushing at times because change happens very slowly, and, and hope takes courage. You know, everybody's Barack Obama hope and change as though it's naive. No, those words take strength and grit and determination to be hopeful in the face of, of despair. And I think each of us individually and collectively have to make up our mind about whether or not we're gonna play in this game called our democracy, because it's actually not a game. And I think that what, what, I did a lot of soul searching after the last election, and I went through kind of the stages of grief, sometimes all on the same day. And uh, where I spun out of it was, because I don't know what quite what happened, but I do know one fact, and that is that 43% of eligible voters did not vote. That's a problem. That's a problem in a democracy that counts on civic participation. And so I think the answer to your question is that the only way that this tone changes, the only way where we're going to have people who are elected who do not just consistently put their short-term political interests ahead of what's best for you, is if you tell them what you want, you demand what you want, and you elect people who reflect your values, and you don't let them get away with not feeling accountable to you, the American people. I think we've learned that uh, if you don't vote, you get what you get, and so much for not getting upset. Elections have consequences. They do. At the, in fact, you talk about realizing the change that's going to come, and it was very hard to process and what that felt like. And you give a lot of insight into Obama throughout the book. This particular thing he says to you, really stay, stay with me, so I'll read you the paragraph. You're sitting on the couch, and you say, I have become a bit wistful. So he moved to the seat on the couch next to me, and with one arm draped over my shoulder, said gently, Valerie, we cut the unemployment rate in half. 20 million people have health care, many for the first time. Any couple can marry. We brought Osama bin Laden to justice and 150,000 troops home from two wars. We have an agreement to keep Iran from developing nuclear weapons. There hasn't been a major terrorist attack on our shores. We restored diplomatic relations with Cuba, and we led the effort for the historic, historic Paris Climate Accord signed by 200 countries around the world. There are two additional extraordinary women serving on the Supreme Court. Our country is not perfect, but it is more just and fair for those who have historically been left behind. I'm alive, my family is alive, you're alive. Yes, there's more work to do, but there always is. We did our best. It's time for us to go. And as I read that, I thought about you 
Because if you go through that list, there are a number of things under attack that he said on that couch. And I wondered what that's like every day to get up and look at the news and know what you did for eight years and to see that list be torn apart. You know, I get asked this question quite often. And uh, look, it was the honor of my life to serve this country for eight years. It truly was. And it was a, you know, there were hard days and they were worth every minute of them. And so when I think about uh, many, of the, uh, many of the steps that I think were moving us forward in the right direction for our country that are being unwound, I don't think about it in the context of my hard work. I think about it in the context of the people whose lives are gonna be hurt by those changes. I think about the parents who have children with pre-existing conditions who right now are wondering whether or not they're going to be able to have insurance for them. One in two Americans have pre-existing conditions. I think about the families at the border who are being torn apart and they don't even know where the kids and the parents are so they can't put them back together. I mean, we treat, we treat animals better than that. Um, I think about a lot of the consequences of steps that are being taken that don't get in the news through the Environmental Protection Agency, for example, that are rolling back and doing basically whatever the coal industry wanted them to do. And, uh, and so is it disappointing and soul crushing and do I worry about the countless Americans and people who are here in our country who are gonna be impacted by those decisions? Sure I do. But I can't actually do anything about that right now. And as we said a moment ago, Tam, elections do have consequences. And so we're, I try to focus my energy, because one of the things, as I said to you early on, is I don't suffer very well for very long, is I try to pour myself into where I feel like I can make a difference. And when I left, I, you know, I felt like I'd had the best job in the world. I used to always tease President Obama that my job was so much better than his. My goodness, <laughs> love my job. And, um, and so, and I turned 60 the week after the presidential election. Nobody would celebrate with me. I didn't want to celebrate. <laughs> but, I, but it was a big landmark. I mean, 60 is big. For those of you who are not 60, you wait and see. Uh, and it was a good kind of watershed moment leaving the administration and turning 60 to, for the first time in my life, look back. And that's part of what led to the book. And I think... Part of what I really began to try to, to focus my attention on is what do I care most about? And you know, when you're on the back nine or the back whatever, three, whatever it is at this stage of my life, every moment is precious. And you should live that way always, but you certainly, the reality starts to sink in. And I said, okay, what do I care about? And, I, and it wasn't really hard for me to come up with because they are the issues that I really focused my, most of my attention on when we were in the White House. And I had to work on every issue, but my heart and soul went into gender equity. And maybe because I'd been a young single mom, thank you. I had been this young single mom, but one with means, one with insurance, one with great daycare, one with parents who provided me a safety net, that I grew up in that context worrying about those working families that don't have those advantages. And, and I wanted to be there and root for them, and yesterday was equal pay day. Well, I don't understand why women and men can't earn the same amount of money, come on now. And so challenging companies to understand why it's in their best interest to want to attract and retain the most talented people. And in order to do that, we have to compete in a global marketplace. And we have to recognize that, yes, you have to pay women equally. And we have to offer paid leave. We're the only developed country in the world that doesn't offer paid leave. We have to offer sick pay. When we were in the White House, the data was that 43 million Americans didn't have a single paid sick day. Uh, we need an environment that's free from sexual harassment and, and uh, violence. In order for people to thrive, this is, it's not rocket science, it's all the things that everybody knows that they need in order to thrive. And I started making a business case for it, and so I continue that work now through the United States of Women. I care a great, great deal about civic engagement, and I guess you could tell that by most of my remarks. And so helping President Obama with his foundation where he's creating this platform for civic engagement takes up a lot of our time. We're interested in helping that young generation, many of who want to do good, and they just don't know how. 
And so let's teach them how to make it as easy as possible for them to go to their communities and make a positive difference and run for office or get involved in government or volunteer at a boys club or come up with a new not-for-profit that serves, um, serves the community. So that takes a lot of my time. And so most of the issues that I care about are ones that began in the White House. Criminal justice reform is another one. That's why I joined the faculty at the University of Chicago to do research on criminal justice and also gender equity. And, um, and then trying to figure out how to get people to vote. And so Mrs. Obama and I started this When We All Vote organization last summer. It's nonpartisan. Our idea is to just change the culture around voting under the theory that when we all vote, our democracy is actually stronger. So that's what I'm doing, and that's what I can control. And I can try to do it in a spirit of optimism, and I can try to lift up the voices of people who uh, want to use their voices to be a force for good with the platform that I have. And I think ultimately, if you look at the arc of our democracy, uh, good wins out. But we're in a tough patch right now, in my opinion. We're kind of in that zigzag that inevitably happens, and it only, it only goes in the direction we want it to if we make it. I'll quickly ask you a couple of current affairs questions before we uh -oh. get to audience questions. Now I'm nervous. Uh, you, you can handle this. OK. Um, right. I'll relax. The president oh, there we go. has already, it's pretty clear. <laughs> That which, he is which president we're talking about? 45. Okay. Um, that he's busy trying to depict the Democrats as socialist. And some have said, are they running too far left, like pushing each other too far left? What is your opinion on that? Could I gingerly ask, does he know what a socialist is? <laughs> <laughs> well, so first of all, I think we've got to stop throwing around all these labels. I mean, I really do. I, the only label I'm actually comfortable with is progressive, because to be progressive means progress. <laughs> it means moving forward. It means fighting for equity and justice. And so um, I think one of the strengths of the Democratic Party is that we have a big tent. All are welcome. I mean, one of the reasons why President Obama won not once but twice is that he appealed to a lot of independents and Republicans. And I think there are room for all kinds of ideas in our tent and that we shouldn't let people depict us as any one thing that has a label on it that the people who are using it probably don't know what it means. And so but I he's think so we should good push back. He's, he, is, um, he is quite good at it. Does it scare you that they're gonna end up, he's gonna depict them as super hippie liberals so far out there, they can't come back to the middle? Well, you know what? They're gonna have to be pretty good at it too. And you know, I think that the Democratic field right now has an embarrassment of riches. There are some terrific candidates out there who I think have a vision for our country that's one of inclusion and appreciating what we have in common and trying to bring us together. And it's an optimistic vision, but it's a realistic vision. And I can, I won't, but I can name several other folks who are in the race who have that attitude. And, and that's heartening to me. And their voices are gonna have to be lifted up. And we're gonna have to help them lift that positive message up. And it is going to, it's a competition. And it's a tension between the direction that we want our country to go in. And again, that's why I appeal to people to educate yourself on the candidates, figure out which one of them do you think not only has the vision, but has the ability to execute that vision in a way that's consistent with your values and your vision for our country. And I think that uh, we'll do that. Someone you worked with quite closely for eight years, Joe Biden, has had a rough week. He has had a rough uh, week. Today, coming out and saying, I get it, I get it, I got to change the way I do this. You've been defensive of him this week, saying, let's look at a fuller picture here. What makes you comfortable saying, let's give him a moment in the face of some of the things that these people are saying? Well, I've said two things this week, and I don't think they're inconsistent. I've said that I agreed with what he said over the weekend, and I certainly agree with what he said today, that this is a moment of change in our country, and that men, men in the audience and around the country, need to listen to women. And that it isn't just all about what your intent is, it's about how what you do is felt by the people to whom it's directed. And I think what he said in the video today, and I only caught it really briefly, was look, I recognize that. And I've spent my whole career devoted to public service. I think he was elected when he was like 28, one of the youngest senators ever in history. And I'm demonstrative, and I go around and I hug everybody, and I, you know, I'm a close talker, and I get right in there, and I try to do that, and I understand that not everybody wants that, and I have to change. And I think it's a good thing in America when somebody says, I have to do things differently because I'm now listening, and we're in a new day. 
And that's how we all grow. And I think part of what we do here is we set ourselves up so that we can't admit something like that. We put people in a corner where they can't say, okay, I hear you. Let me see if I can do this differently. Let me learn, let me grow, for example. And so my experience with him was unbelievably outstanding. I saw him when I chaired the White House Council of Women and Girls. He was a fierce advocate. He, was a, he wrote the Violence Against Women Act. He was right there leading our effort to end the epidemic of sexual assault on our college campuses. Uh, and, and I always felt he treated me with utmost respect. But that's actually not the question. The question is, how do the people who he touched, who come forward, how do they feel? And I think recognizing that their emotions and their feelings count uh, is something that we should commend. And the ones who say, as Lucy Flores did, I think it's disqualifying, what do you say to them? I say one of the great things about our country is she gets to decide that and somebody else gets to decide something else. And if, if he should get in the race, and look, we're disqualifying him, he hasn't even gotten in the race yet, but should he get in, then you, the American people, get to decide if it's disqualifying. And he, as a candidate, um, I believe, has to go out there and earn the trust and the respect and the confidence of the American people. And if he doesn't do that, then he won't be the president. Or if somebody does it better, then they will be the president. And so I don't say, I don't say that you can um, tell somebody they shouldn't run. All you can say is that you're not going to vote for them. Chicago has decided on its next mayor. And at a time in this country where trends seem to be going one way, a traditionalist city has picked a black gay woman How about that? as its mayor. <laughs> You're from Chicago. And on an ending note here, what is this election, in the midst of all of this other information coming in, what does this election say to you about where we are? Well, it's a sign of hopefulness. I have to tell you, I spoke with Lori, well, I spoke with both candidates this morning. I had supported Tony Prackwinkle. She was my alderman. I've known her for 30 years. We've worked together very closely, and I think she's done a terrific job on issues I care about as a chairman of the Cook County Board, uh, both in terms of criminal justice reform and public health. Uh, but I also knew Lori very well, and if Tony Prackwinkle hadn't entered the race, I would have endorsed her, no matter who else was in the race. And when I talked to them both this morning, I said, look, we have a black woman head of the county, and we have a black woman now the mayor of Chicago, and you two, and they had a pretty tough campaign. I said, you, you two have to come together. And uh, the potential and hope for our city is enormous. But winning an election is just the first step. You then have to get people to work with you and support you. And Lori has some tough, well, I should say mayor-elect Lightfoot. That has a nice ring to it. She has some real tough. Uh, decisions as really all big city mayors have right now. It's a tough time because budgets are tight, we're not getting a lot of resources from the federal government, and there's a limit to what people will pay in taxes at the local level. And the delicate balance in Chicago, as I learned, is that you have to tax people just enough so that you can pay for those basic services, but not so much that they leave the city. And there was a great exodus from Chicago for a while, and people had been coming back. And a lot of it was people who just loved the city. It was dynamic and exciting, and they got tired of sitting on that expressway. Uh, and so the challenge for the mayor-elect is to how to keep business in the city, improve the public education system, reduce the crime while strengthening the bond of trust between police and the communities of color that is probably at an all-time low. So she's got a big plate full ahead of her, and she, you can't do it alone. And I don't care how great of a leader you are, leader means other people must follow. And so I think she's going to have to figure out ways of getting the city of Chicago to be with her as she makes these tough decisions. Could you talk about your own views with regard to education and the accusations that the teachers union has been too inflexible in their willingness to adopt change and to new teaching techniques and the Democratic Party suffers as a result of that? Well, so um, we had two education secretaries, Arnie Duncan, who had run the public school system in Chicago, and John Harris, who had been his number two. And their vision was, look, we have a strong teachers union and we need to support our teachers. I actually think we should pay te teachers a lot more money, and I think it should be based on merit. <laughs> My goodness, they're in charge of our children. Why would we not pay them um, a, a much better salary? And there has been some resistance to the merit-based system that Arnie Duncan supported, which we supported. 
And so I think what you have to do is you have to encourage the teachers union to know that there will be integrity in that process. And I think that they had some legitimate concerns on the ground around the country as to whether that meritocracy would actually be legitimate. And being transparent and open about what the evaluation tools are and how you're making the decisions, I think is something that you have to earn trust slowly. And it moves slower than I would want it to move. But I am very frustrated that our children in this country are not getting the quality of education that they need in order to compete in a global marketplace. And we have to do something about that. I want to ask you about Russian interference and not in light of whether or not the president himself was involved, but about the implications. Did I say that wrong? President no, Trump. No, no, okay. you good. Sorry. You're um, good. Thank you for qualifying it yes, that Yes, so there is appears to be evidence that a lot of the effort was directed at making sure the African-American community vote was suppressed. Yes, not just by the Russians, I might add. Uh, okay. Well, right, I mean, one person, no vote, as Carol Anderson's new book talks about. Um, but can you talk about that, what's happening with social media and what, it, what we should be looking for to make sure it doesn't happen in 2020? Look, it is a powerful tool, and I think, in a sense, we rode the, the wave where social media was the darling. It was bringing the world closer together. We were able to learn more about one another. I mean, I remember going to the library and looking things up on index cards, and now you just push a button. It's very cool. Um, and, but we weren't aware of all of the consequences of the growth and, the, and the, just the magnitude, the size of these companies who seem to be unable to control themselves. And there's this tension between privacy and censorship and invasion and manipulation of, of our, of our um, information. And I think regulation is coming their way. And I spend a fair amount of time out in Silicon Valley. I'm on the board of two tech companies, Lyft, um, the ride sharing company that just went public, and also on to you that does um, provides the software for universities to offer postgraduate degrees online. And so I'm learning a lot about technology. And what I've said to the folks um, in the tech industry who were worried about regulation, legitimately so, as I said nicely, don't be like the banks were to Dodd-Frank and spend a fortune resisting it. Help them figure out how to design it in a way where there aren't unintended consequences and where you can thrive, but you can thrive where we are safer from misinformation. And I think, I don't know that, I don't know how to do that. That's not what my expertise is, but I believe that some very smart people can figure it out. And, the, and, and in terms of the specific question on the election, I kind of come at it with a kind of a blunt instrument, which is to say, if enough people vote, we'll have a bigger margin of error, and if there's a little bit of mischief, then it won't make as big of a difference. And I am um, somewhat heartened by the fact that the elections are run by the different states, and so you have to, you'd have to go in and infiltrate every single state to try to manipulate it, but the information flow is something that is ubiquitous. And we have to, we have to get educated, and we have to be able to tell the difference between fact and fiction, which means that we have to be, be more discerning users of social media, of media in general. And I think that uh, designing a way to try to limit the risk is what you're gonna see happen in Congress. But I would say to you, it was kind of apparent at those hearings that they don't actually understand it very well themselves. <laughs> and that's okay, but then they need to get smart. And the best way to get smart is that the people who do understand it help them. And I'm not saying that they should write the regulations, but I'm saying that they should be in there helping people who are going to be making decisions about the future flow of information about how to do it in a responsible way. President Obama had, uh, won with a uh, fairly large base in uh, uh, 2008. Uh, a lot of the voters seem to have turned to uh, President Trump in uh, 2016. So in retrospect, do you think that uh, uh, President Obama did a good job in uh, trying to retain his base for the Democratic Party? That's a fair question. Um, yeah, I do. I, th I think one of the things that we learned the hard way is that his popularity turned out to not be as transferable as perhaps I would have wished. 
And I think people made up their own minds about candidates and the fact that he endorsed and campaigned and did everything he could possibly do to help Hillary Clinton win, in the end, it didn't push her over. Now, she did win the popular vote, which I think people tend to forget, and she only lost by less than 100,000 votes in three states, and so it was an awful close election. So I wouldn't read too much into this last election in terms of using it as a metric as to whether or not President Obama did everything he could. I can tell you he worked his fanny off in the midterm elections, and I think that that turned out pretty well for the Democratic Party. And my guess is that I mean, he's met with every single candidate, and there are so many candidates running for <laughs> office, there isn't a single one of them that's asked to meet with him who he has not said absolutely yes to, and he's encouraged them all and given them the benefit of his wisdom, and I'm sure that you will expect to see him, certainly by the general election, get very involved in the next presidential race. Um, so I think he's doing his best, and if people have suggestions for what you think he could do better in the future, I would be happy to entertain them, but there's really not much we can do about the past other than try to make sure that everybody votes. Valerie, um, Mayor Pete Buttigieg has gotten a lot of attention recently. I'm so impressed you know how to say his name. I've been practicing. I bet you have. <laughs> we all have. Why do you think a mayor from South Bend, Indiana is getting this kind of attention this early on? And what do you think um, that says about the kind of candidate the Democrats will need to win in 2020? So the answer to your first question is that he's authentic. And he has a really great personal story. Here he is, a gay veteran from South Bend, um, a traditionally red state, but a, but a city mayor. And he's really smart, but not in a smart where you feel like you're dumb, but like, wow, he's really making sense. He's good, and he's good on his feet, and he makes a compelling case, and he's honest, uh, and, it, and it appears as such. And I think he caught, you know, he kind of caught on. But then, you know, I just saw Beto O'Rourke in New York today. He caught on, and Elizabeth Warren has caught on in some places, and Elizabeth Bale, I said that for you. Um, and and uh, certainly Kamala Harris. I mean, I'm not going to list them all because we would be here all night. But a lot of the candidates, I think, are catching on, and people are hungry, I think, for leadership. And they're hungry for someone with a vision and someone who has a positive sense of the direction our country can go in. And I think that Mayor Pete has that. Uh, he has that. He has it. And the question will be, how does he do a year from now? There's nothing like Iowa, boy. It's a great reckoner. It's retail politics. And I think some of the folks will thrive there, and maybe some won't. Uh, but, the, but the good news is that this is still really early. And, and someone was asking me earlier today to try to you know, guess what's going to happen. And I said, do you remember that Barack Obama was like down by 20 points at this point in his race against Hillary Clinton? So no, you can't tell very much in April of the year before the election. Uh, but it's going to be fascinating to see whether somebody like Pete can get traction. And not just traction in the first when you come out of the gate and you're new and shiny and interesting but is it sustainable? And that'll be the test. Thank you very much. When I hear you speak, it makes me very nostalgic for better times, but... Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my, my question is, though, what were the discussions that went on when it was first found out that the Russians were interfering with our election and I'm sure there were some pretty heavy debates about, should we say anything? Should we not interfere? What were those conversations about? Well, the first thing we did is we went to Leader McConnell and asked, uh, asked him, I know, they start, it's like full stop, right? So, well, no, seriously, we went to Leader McConnell and we said, would you help us with the Republican Secretaries of State? Be mindful of the fact that we have detected some intervention and we need to take every step possible to ferret it out and to communicate with the people in those states about how they can protect the integrity of the system. And what Leader McConnell said might not surprise you. He said no. <laughs> he said no. And so there were limits to what we could do because it's a, it's a very delicate balance. You don't want to, well, first of all, we didn't know as much as we know now. We didn't want to threaten the integrity of the voting system, but we wanted the people who were responsible for the integrity to take as many diligent steps as they could to protect it. And we needed the leader of the Republican Party 
to go back to the Republican states where he had a lot more influence with the secretaries of state than we could possibly have, and he simply said no. So I'm gonna end on a question that I'm sure a that you- A more positive note than that. We can't end on, on Leader McConnell. That's no, just... we can't. But I'm gonna, I bet you you get this question just about everywhere you go, and I think people here would wanna know your answer. If people ask me, I see people ask politicians all the time, are we gonna be okay? When they look and they see what's going on, and you, saw, you see the difference in a different way, they deep down inside, that it's that basic, are we going to be okay? All right, so if I answer that question, and I tell you the ending of my book, you still have to read it. <laughs> because it gets really good once you get up to this point. So my mom, who you will get to know in the book, is quite a character. And she and my father had an interesting marriage in that my mother sees the world through the lens of being half empty. Maybe it's like two thirds empty. And so she protects about every possible scenario that could go wrong. And that's how she gets through the day. And then she shares that with everybody. Because God forbid you be unprepared for the doom that is going to await you. My father and I are different. We think everything's gonna be fine. And we go into the world thinking that everything's gonna be fine, and when it's not fine, we're very disturbed and upset, but then we get over it and we come up with a new plan for how everything is gonna be fine. And so I'm, I'm somewhat, I'm really much more like my dad in that respect, but I do have my mother in the back of my mind. And so um, my mother and I had a conversation several months ago about the state of the world, very similar to what we've been talking about, Tam, here tonight. And so my mother told me all the things that are going wrong, and she did the long list of everything that has been um, reversed since uh, the new administration took office and challenges around the world. I mean, it was just like a terrible, terrible list of everything that was going wrong. And then I gave her a list of everything that was going right. These young people from Parkland who are just amazing, who could have in the face of a horrible tragedy just recoiled and know they travel the country, red and blue states alike, registering people to vote. And I talked about the Women's March, and I talked about people who are protesting violence in the streets and police, the relationship between police and communities of color. And I mean, I had a list that was just as long as her list. And so we had a bit of a stalemate there. And at the end of the conversation, my mother said to me, the difference between us is that you think we're almost at the mountaintop. And she said, and I think we're dangling over the precipice. And that really sums up my mom and me. And I think it sums up the situation, right? And what I realized is that we're both right, that we really are making so much progress in our country. We are light years ahead of when my dad had to leave this country because he couldn't find a job. But we still, a lot could go wrong. And the only way that we go one way or the other is you. And so if you ask me, am I hopeful and are we gonna be all right? I say to you, yes. And the reason why I say yes is because I'm counting on you, every single one of you and people all across this country to make a difference. Save us from the precipice. <laughs> Thank you.